Welcome to Worship at Redeemer Lutheran Church. I'm Pastor Lisa Bates Froyland, and today we'll be focusing on listening in to Jesus as he prays on our behalf. We have great music planned throughout the worship service and a special surprise at the end. We worship in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs> First reading is coming from 1 Peter chapter 4 verses 12 through 14. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that is taking place among you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice in so far as you are sharing Christ's suffering so that you may also be glad and shout for joy when his glory is revealed. If you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the Spirit of glory, which is the Spirit of God, is resting on you. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that he may exalt you in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. Discipline yourselves, keep alert. Like a roaring lion, your adversary, the devil, prowls around looking for someone to devour. Resist him, steadfast in your faith, for you know that your brothers and sisters in all the world are undergoing the same kinds of suffering. And after you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you into his eternal glory in Christ, himself will restore, support, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen.
This week's gospel is found in the book of John, the 16th chapter, beginning at the 32nd verse. Jesus said to his disciples, The hour is coming, indeed it has come, when you will be scattered, each one to his home, and you will leave me alone. Yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. I have said this to you, so that in me you may have peace. In the world, you face persecution. But take courage. I have conquered the world. After Jesus had spoken these words, he looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, so that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all people, to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth by finishing the work that you gave me to do. So now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory that I had in your presence before the world existed. I have made known your name to those whom you gave me from the world. They were yours, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything you have given me is from you. For the words that you gave to me, I have given to them, and they have received them, and know in truth that I came from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I am asking on their behalf. I am not asking on behalf of the world, but on behalf of those whom you gave me, because they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. And now I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you, Holy Father. Protect them in your name that you have given me, so that they may be one as we are one. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. What an opportunity in this Gospel of John to listen in on Jesus' very heart. It's just before he's about to be arrested and go to the cross and to there be glorified, as the scripture says, through his selfless sacrifice. But before that time, he talks to his disciples and then he prays directly to his Father God. And what does he say? Well, there's a whole tangle of possessive pronouns in here. Did you figure that out? What's mine is yours and yours is mine and I'm in you and you're in me and and all of this has been put, placed in these human beings now. They carry the message. They carry the truth. But Jesus is concerned because once Jesus departs from them, they will each return to their own house. And doesn't that sound like our reality these days? each of us in our own houses, listening to our own media choices, forming our own opinions, for which there is a truth and there are facts. This was Jesus' concern as well. These disciples had been walking with him, watching his every move in ministry, listening to him try to explain the faith to them. He thought they got it. At the end, he thought they got it but now they were about to be dispersed. Will there be unity? So as Jesus is praying, you listen hard and you listen, what is he really asking for from the Father? And finally in the last verse it comes out, protect them. That's what he wants God to do for them, protect them. Now so often we hear this word protect in our own prayers. And we, when we pray for protection, when someone prays that for me, they're usually asking God to protect me from harm, from injury, from disease, from distraction. But that's not what Jesus is praying for here. The protection that Jesus wants is from them becoming disunited, from them having their own versions of the truth of their walk with Jesus, and that the message would be, broken, diluted, dispersed, would lack its emphasis. 
that's still Jesus's prayer for our whole church, that it would be unified. Not all the same. Unity and sameness are two different things, but unified in the heart of it all, which is Jesus, the path to peace, the conviction about love, the concern for all humanity, the compassion in suffering. We are united to this Jesus and to this God with a deep connection. And that's what Jesus wants for us. The beautiful word abiding is also a part of this gospel, that Jesus abides in us and, and we in him. From 1 Peter, the reading that you heard from Joyce and Byron earlier in this service, the promise after the suffering ends is that the God of grace will restore us, support us, will strengthen us, and will establish us. And establish means to ground us, to ground us in the reality of Jesus' love and forgiveness. Of course, the pandemic is the story these days, but it's not the only story. We know that there are a lot of senseless losses of life going on here, and many of them have racial overtones. It reminded me of a story of something that happened right here last fall. It was a Sunday around 2.30 in the afternoon when I came in the door and saw a man sitting in this chair right here. And he's wearing a very bright colored jacket like this one. I wondered why he was sitting there. The newspaper was near him. Of course, Noon Run had finished a long time ago. So I asked Charlie, the beekeeper, who was still in his office, what was it with this man and uh, why was he still here? And Charlie said, I asked him to leave. I told him lunch was over and he won't move. Well, I knew we had a lot of people coming in soon for a variety of different events and that Noon Run had finished. So I went over and tried to talk to him we exchanged smiles, and I spoke with him, and I explained to him that the meal was over and it was time to go, and there were other things going on in the church. He was peaceful. He had a pleasant look on his face, but there was something about him that was profoundly locked away. I couldn't get through. I tried humor. I tried walking away for a while, tried coming back, tried saying five more minutes, came back. He would stare down at the newspaper, although he wasn't reading it. There was something about him that was locked away, and I couldn't get through. And I knew it was getting to be the time when maybe I would need some help. I told him, I don't want to call the police right now. I don't want them to lead you out of here. Let me walk you out. Over and over, time after time, it was intern Mark Fraley's first weekend here, and I had him spend some time at this table as well. I was praying for a peaceful resolution. He was a very big man, um, full of muscles, a nice smile too, that grows stonily quiet, and then there was no affect at all. I couldn't figure out what was going on. Finally, I said, okay, I have the phone in my hand. I don't want to dial Marquette Police but I will if you don't get up and walk out with me now. He stayed there. So I called the police, and very soon an officer arrived, a white officer. I explained to him the situation. This was a peaceful man, but didn't seem to understand that it was time that he needed to leave. So the officer started, same kind of thing that I did, same kind of results that I got. At one point, the officer put a hand on his shoulder, and he flinched noticeably. A second officer arrived. They worked on things together. And then because it's Redeemer, a troop of Turkish folk dancers came in to do their rehearsal. So they started up their music, and they were dancing about 50 yards away. I thought maybe this weirdness might jolt him into a, a different part of his reality and help him to hear what was going on. It didn't. Even my humorous invitation to join them in dancing went nowhere. Finally, the officers said, um, I appreciate what you're doing by staying near. I was in prayer constantly. 
Um, but if you could give us just a moment alone. I was so afraid of what was going to happen next. But prayerfully, I moved the Turkish dancers to another part of the church, and we stood there and waited and prayed and breathed. And then I heard laughter, and I heard casual conversation, and I heard footsteps on the steps leading out of the church. And the officer said, well, goodbye now. Have a good one. And the man said, you too. Thanks for everything. And it was over. And the door closed. When the officers came back down the step, I said, what happened? How did that come about? And the officer said, for some reason, when I looked at my watch and I said, you know, it's 3.30. Something broke open for him. And he said, 3.30? I need to go. And he immediately got up and left. Thanks be to God for a peaceful resolution in that case. But it just goes to show the kind of patience that's necessary sometimes, the kind of caring, and the deep, deep, deep commitment to de-escalation. These officers had it. We had a different result here. Thanks be to God. My question for you today is, if you are feeling like a part of you is getting locked away, what are the simple words that could open the door for you? How about this from the Gospel of John? Jesus saying, in me, in me, peace is yours. Amen. In John chapter 17, Jesus prays to God, and in part reminds God that he has been given permission and power to give eternal life. What is meant by eternal life? Jesus says that they know you, God, that they know you. Like me, you might be thoroughly saturated with suggestions from many sources that led you to have a fairly solid notion that eternal life means just one thing, that after you physically die, some portion of you lives on forever and ever in heaven with God. The understanding Jesus shares here, though, is a kind of eternal consciousness that we walk around with day by day because we are people of faith. Our spiritual selves perceive past, present, and future all at once. We are connected to people who came before us, and we think about the generations to come. We know we walk on land that was home to other peoples. As pastor of a church that has been in existence since 1890, I think often of the pastors who went before me and the sermons preached from where I preach now. One part of what makes Holy Communion so cosmically special is the connection we share across time and place because of the holy power of the sacrament. There is an eternal life to our existence as people created by God that are invited to know God, to know God, Yes, through intellectual groping, but even more so through the most intimate of relationships. No one knows you better than God. This Monday is Memorial Day, originally called Decoration Day, intended to acknowledge the deaths of both Confederate and Union soldiers in the Civil War. The carnage on both sides was sadly one thing that unified them. Later, Memorial Day, meant to be a time to acknowledge the life sacrifices of all in the armed forces who perished as they served. There's also a tradition to use this weekend every year as an opportunity for family members to visit the grave sites of relatives and place flowers. I looked forward to going with my mom each year and hearing her tell stories of people I'd never met but somehow still felt connected to. Last year, my daughter made the trek and perhaps one day she will do the same for the next generation. Our gratitude for God's blessings of the past, our day-to-day -day walk with God now, and our hopefulness because of Christ, they are all fused together, and they are the eternality of life. Thanks be to God.
So hey, here we are standing in what was most recently the Zyther Group office. Uh, way back when, it was the choir room, used for about two hours of every week. Um, it became a bustling center for Zyther Group. And now we're very excited to welcome in the Interfaith Conference of Greater Milwaukee. So Jen Devitt is sitting here, and now her name is Jen Devitt Mana because she got married a while ago. But I knew her as Jen Devitt to begin with. Um, has helped us with the lease agreement, so she came by for the signing. Sherry Hansen is also here. She works for the Interfaith Conference. And of course, this is Pardeep Kalika, who is the Executive Director of the Interfaith Conference of Greater Milwaukee. And when did you start in that role? Oh, I, uh, nine months ago, ten months ago. And yeah, it feels like a couple of years, though. But <laughs> I think just because we've been through so much in this past nine, ten months that uh, it feels like yeah, just uh, it's been longer, but yeah, just uh, just ten months ago. And uh, Pastor Lisa, we are ecstatic and excited as well. Thank you, Jen. Thank you, Sherry. Um, thank you to everyone at Redeemer, Seidler, um, everything that you have all done to make this day possible. Uh, we really just we're we're you know we're excited about the future going forward. Um, proud of the work that you all have done, uh, you know, in the past, and and just yeah, just uh, really, I mean, just you know, we're we're. Uh, we're going to enter into this new relationship, and uh, I think, you know, for everyone that's watching out there, um, you know, feel free to, to contact us, let us know what we can do, uh, how we can, uh, you know, plan events together and things like that, but, uh, you know, we're excited. It's a new relationship in some senses, but it's also got some vestiges of the old, too. Um, in the sermon today, I talk about eternality as being kind of the fusion of past, present, and future. And you can't see this uh, little red light, but uh, I can see a picture of Mayor Frank Zeidler on the wall to the other side of this room. Mayor Zeidler was the, was, uh, this was his faith home his entire life. And he had a lot of brilliant ideas and he was able to convince others to help him in that effort. And one of those ideas was what is now the Interfaith Conference yeah. of Greater Milwaukee. I was telling Pardeep earlier that I went on the internet last night did you know there's an encyclopedia of Milwaukee? And the, the entrance for Interfaith Conference reveals that it started out as an idea in the, 19, in the late 1960s, 1968, that summer of the race riots. Mm. And Mayor Zeidler got together with Rabbi Steinberg and um, Archbishop Cousins at the time. And they talked about what can we do? And so originally the title of the group was the Conference on Religion and Race. Yep. And they were working on housing, and they were working on the draft, and all kinds of advocacy types of yeah. issues. What kind of advocacy um, areas is Interfaith working in now? So, I, I, you know, over over the years, um, we've done a lot of stuff as far as like the time and what the time called for. Um, as of as of you know, we've worked on detention center crisis, uh, gun reform. Um, still working on. Uh, uh, getting people access to employment and jobs and, and housing, fair housing. So we're still written into a lot of the bylaws of a lot of um, agencies in, in Milwaukee County, the uh, city of Milwaukee, the, the uh, ethics boards. Um, and that was kind of the inspiration back then of like, okay, let's, with these agencies who are going to be doing some of this work, let's get our faith communities out there and doing some of this work and making sure that we are doing this work ethically and morally and having a uh, spiritual consciousness mm -hmm. about what we do and that's really the work that we've been doing as far as like advocacy and building relationships is to build those relationships and that trust before we we, we you know we uh, come to the table and really discuss uh, some of that advocacy and, and those can you know sometimes people say well you know let's build trust or let's let's take on advocacy mm. but we can do both those things at the same time and I think Mayor uh, Zeidler really had that that vision of let's really bring sort of this you know we talk about this where we, the wisdom of the well and the living water and bring them together and how, how can we do this work going forward right so it's a consensus based model mm -hmm. for all of your work right and how many different faith communities are now represented represented we we have 20, well, we have 20 judicatories right now, but we are going to uh, formally recognize the Baha'i community mm -hmm. of southeastern Wisconsin as the next newest uh, judicatory. So 21 judicatories with more than 500 um, physical locations. Wow, that is super exciting. And what's the advantage of being located here at 19th and Wisconsin? You know, there's, there's numerous advantages. Um, I think just 
what Redeemer ha and, and continues to do um, and, and the service work that you engage in, um, the educational, the uh, building relationships across different d divides with the Zyla group. Um, I think just the advantage is, is, is you know, being located in a very sacred spiritual place and being grounded in that foundation and building from there. And, and we know that that's, that's the relationship that we want to have and um, that's how we want to move forward. And of course, we're right next door to one of uh, the state's largest educational private true, institutions, yeah, yeah. Marquette University, with a lot of young students who are learning about the world from this location and yeah. can do so more because... I did my undergrad at Marquette University. Uh -huh. Yes, <laughs> so you know the territory. I do know the territory. You know the and, territory. and what's, uh, you know, I think that sometimes those that don't know the culture of Marquette from, from inside, you know, I, I, I recall going to a lot of different, like, theological, you know, you have to take four years of, of just, you know, you get theology. To. You get to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You get to. <laughs> well, for, for, a, for a person who was not, <laughs> you know, not Christian or not Catholic. Right. I didn't know any of that stuff. Yeah. Because I always went to public schools. And then I kind of went to Marquette. And, you know, first, the first question that they asked the first day was, how many people have gone to private schools or have had, and everybody kind of raised their hands. And the teacher was like, well, how many people have not? And here's Pardeep raising his hand. Wow. And I was like, oh my God, this is going to be a long, <laughs> this is going to be difficult. Uh -huh. Because you're kind of like learning. But, but I remember learning so many lessons that Jesus Christ embodied. I remember, I like, and, and really I didn't, I don't think at, at and no disrespect to the schools that I went to before mm -hmm. that, but they really had, like, they take on this Jesuit sort of like theological model of, what is right? What is wrong? What what would you do in this situation? Um, and you would think that you're learning the theology, but you're really learning morality. Right, right. Yeah, and we found, you know, at Redeemer Lutheran that our kind of living out our Lutheran theology jives really well with the Jesuit yeah. mindset as well. And that's why we have uh, Marquette students in the building six days a week serving food to people in the neighborhood who are hungry at that time. We're all praying that the pandemic uh, will abate to a certain extent or we get vaccinations or whatever so we can start that kind of connection again. Because yeah. yeah. we like to share food. And that prompts me to ask Jen to present you with our little office warming gift. Aww, this is you, so Jen. typical of the pandemic. So take a look <laughs> inside because I want Redeemer people to know that I'm still baking bread. I <laughs> <laughs> So this is last night. Can I, can I grab it? Yeah, you got to show it to the people. Um, this isn't the regular communion bread I make. This is a, a loaf of oh. homemade sourdough, no extra yeast included. So I, I hope you're done with that paleo thing you were trying for. Yeah, I'm done now. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so enjoy the bread. I've been running a lot, so I think thank you so much, okay. uh, to everyone that uh, you know at Redeemer, and thank you so much, Pastor Lisa. Thank you so much, Jen, Sherry. I think uh, yeah, just. Uh, yeah, I'm done with the diet. Okay. <laughs> yeah, we're going to eat this tonight. <laughs> yeah. Welcome we to Redeemer. Welcome we are grateful that we can break bread with you and, and uh, be, um, be family. Awesome. Yeah. Great. Thank you. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you, make his face to shine upon you, lift up his favor upon you, and give to you his peace. Amen. Take three.
Shine. 